So yes, let's uh, let's start. Well, good morning, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm really glad to to be here, and uh, it's the first presentation I will give uh, like this online. So we are fully in the 21st century. Uh, this is the the we are the our present is uh, the future. I thought this is uh, this is quite impressive. I'm, I'm really happy to see that uh, so many of you have uh, have joined us. So to begin, perhaps I will uh, present uh, myself and also uh, Ramona will introduce herself. So my name is Leticia Montero. I work at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. I'm uh, in the team that has been, uh, that has been leading uh, this, uh, this boot camp and also the forum that you have uh, heard about. Um, Myself, I am an, an economist. I, I do work more on uh, environmental issues, but today we're going to talk about uh, the economic and social impacts on uh, COVID-19. And now I will give the, the floor to Ramona just to, uh, so that she can present herself. Hello, I'm Ramona. Um, I am just. I joined the U uh, the UN uh, ECA just two weeks ago, and uh, uh, Leticia is uh, my colleague. And um, I um, recently graduated in innovation management from the University of Trento and Sant'Anna of Pisa. Um, and today you are going to uh, present this um, analysis of uh, ECA on the impact uh, of the COVID on, um, uh, on Africa. Continued. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ramona. Um, so just before we go into the, the, this uh, publication, as uh, Ramona has mentioned, I would like to talk to you a bit and encourage you to take a survey that uh, the UN has launched. As you might know, uh, this year we are um, having the 25th anniversary of the United Nations. And as such, um, the UN is running the largest ever global survey. And how the, the, the survey is about how you would like the world to be in the next years, next 20 years. And I think it's really important that you as a young people answer this survey because um, once again, you are the present, but also you are the future. And this um, allow me to tell you that uh, in, the, for the, in the development uh, of Africa, the, the, the first, the most important agenda is the agenda of the African Union which has objective to in 2063. Actually, this is the, how we call this agenda, the 2063 agenda. And it's in 2063, uh, I hope I will be an old wise lady, but for sure I'm not going to be working anymore. I'll, I'll be retired by this time, but you will still be in charge. So it's important that you as a young leaders in your country, in your community, uh, in the continent, but also uh, globally, that we hear your voice. So I'm really inviting you to, to answer to this, um, this survey. And I will share um, a small uh, video, it just take one minute. I hope the quality will be good of the sound. Hi, Letita. I've taken this survey before. Hello? 
Can I repeat it? Sorry, Mahmoud, can you repeat? Yeah, I've taken this survey before. So uh, the question is, uh, if it, we have to take the questionnaire right, right now. So like I've taken, I've, the, 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 the link is for a survey and I've taken the survey before. Uh, I'll type after the link. So the, the link is there, UN75 apps online. Um, but if you have taken the survey already, it's, it's, there is no need to, to take it again. It's just that um, I wanted to take this opportunity to share it with you and the people that haven't taken this uh, survey before can, can take it now. So is it, I wasn't hearing the, the discussion while the, the, uh, the movie was on, so is it, is it okay? Shall we continue or is there a question, a permit uh, question? I think the, the movie is not uh, working. Ah, you haven't seen the, the movie? I, no. I did see, <laughs> sorry, I was seeing it on my screen. I thought, uh, I thought I had shared it with you. Never mind. Uh, I will, when, when um, Ramona will be talking, I will share the link so that uh, all of you can, uh, can see it. No, no, not, it's not a problem. So we'll, um, I'm sorry, I, as I was re seeing it on my screen, I, I believe that you, you were seeing it. No problem. We'll, uh, we'll, um, I will share with you the, the link after. So, um, as uh, Ramona was uh, mentioning, the presentation that we are going to, to have uh, today is based on this publication, COVID-19 in Africa, Rotating Lives and Economies. And uh, we are going to, um, to have three uh, different sections, one on people, on how this uh, pandemic has impacted the health of the people, on prosperity, what is the economic impact of this pandemic and on partnership, uh, which is how, how countries and people can cooperate uh, in order to, um, to be more efficient and effective in uh, fi fighting this pandemic. So uh, first, regarding people, we will first talk about the exporter. How many cases are there currently in Africa? Then the susceptibility, uh, are the condition in Africa, um, how will impact the, the livelihood conditions in Africa uh, on this pandemic. The vulnerability, how prepared is Africa to face the pandemic. And finally, the impact on uh, the lives of people. So how is spreading in Africa? Um, I believe that you can see uh, here the, uh, the cursor. So Africa is the red line here. Uh, to, this week we have 7,000 cases daily. We have new cases, 7,000 daily additional cases in Africa. And uh, even though in the first week uh, Africa was uh, doing extremely well with uh, just a few cases, we can see that unfortunately um, the amounts are raising sharply. And uh, we can see it's the similar curve to India or Latin America, and we are still on this rise. Other countries here, we have the example of Spain and the UK. We can see how the, the, they are now in a, the second phase of the pandemic with a huge uh, reduction on their daily cases. And in Africa, there are two main spots, one in North Africa and one in uh, Southern Africa. But here, even though the information I'm giving is not really positive, the, the, the good thing uh, on Africa, in Africa is that there is a really young population with 60% of uh, the population that is below 25 years old, which means that this population is not at risk and hopefully uh, the, the impact of the virus will not be uh, that strong. And also the second good news is that as the pandemic is arriving in Africa with a bit of delay, 
African countries can learn from uh, the, the experience of other countries, good things and bad things that have, is, have been done and adapt this to their national contexts. The other point I wanted to mention is how livelihoods condition will affect the transmission of COVID-19. So in Africa, almost half of the population lives in city and of this population, half of it uh, lives in slum. So has, as you can imagine, it, it's going to be really hard for people li living in those conditions to respect uh, social distancing. And this is going to be a huge problem. And on the um, similar uh, basis, people that have access to um, hand washing facilities is just a third of the population. So just one people over three has access to water and to soap in the continent. So here again, to respect the recommendation gave, given by uh, WHO, it's going to be really hard um, for the continent, which might increase the, the acceleration of the spreading of the virus. How is Africa to fight against COVID-19? Here also, I, there are a huge challenges. The first one is, of course, the health system. And you can see, uh, you can see it by the number of hospital beds available per uh, 1,000 people. In average, in the continent, it's 1.8. If you compare, in France, for example, it's almost six beds uh, per 1,000 uh, people. So here we have a, a huge difference and it's going to be really complicated for the country to absorb uh, the people that will need to be hospitalized. And the other difficulty is that Africa is uh, almost entirely reliant on importation to have access to medicinal and uh, pharmaceutical products. 94% of um, those products are important. So also here, if other countries decided to um, to close or to reduce their exportation on some uh, medical or pharmaceutical it's uh, going to be really complicated for Africa to have access to them. And we have seen it at the beginning of the pandemic where, for example, mask, masks were not uh, available. And all this has an impact uh, in terms of lives. And here in this graphic, uh, we can see a projection, different scenarios made by the Imperial College. So, uh, we have four scenarios. The first one, scenario A, unmitigated, is if we don't apply any, any measures to, to mitigate the spread of the virus, if we don't do anything. So the number of infected people is going to be uh, 1,200 million of people, which is basically the whole continent is going to be infected. Uh, 22 million people will then require hospitalization, 4 million people will require critical care, and the amount of dead people might rise 3.3 uh, million. This is, of course, the worst case scenario, and we know that this is not going to happen because uh, already a lot of measures have been put in place by the countries. But if we were in this scenario, um, the projected increase in health spending uh, would be 321%. In the best case scenario, scenario D, uh, we can, and the best case scenario is if we implement strict measures on social distanciation. So uh, using intense and early physical distancing. So in this case, uh, the number of deaths will be around 0 0.3 uh, million people, which is already a lot. And here, I just want to emphasize that we say that when, when one person dies, it's a tragedy. But if we are talking about 0 0.3 million, it becomes statistics. So we lose this uh, relation to what it means for people. But of course, this is, a comp this is disastrous. Uh, but once again here, um, 
I want to say that Africa has uh, already been doing a lot, uh, taken a lot of measures, and we have seen that the, 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 in the first week, uh, the spread of the virus was uh, very, very low. Um, and also something important here to realize is that the numbers that we have, the numbers that we manage, it's, it's quite hard to compare it in between countries because it depends on testing and texting has not been uh, widely available in all the country. So also all those data uh, need to be taken with a lot of uh, precaution. So Africa is fighting back and has taken early strict actions. Here you can see um, the situation regarding the measures that we have taken regarding lockdowns. So uh, as, as of the 25th of May, 32 African countries had taken strict measures on lockdowns. 21 of, those, of these lockdowns have already been in place for at least 50 days. So it had a huge, huge impact on, on the spread of the virus. And uh, also what we can see is that we have several countries, the countries here with the yellow part, that are easing their lockdown. So the situation is uh, evolving so, so rapidly. We hope that the, those are the good measures to, to uh, ease lockdowns. But we have seen that the numbers of people infected have been increasing. So uh, those, those measures have to be uh, taken, uh, the decision has to be taken with care. In this map, you can see the government response stringency index. So you can see where your country is in terms of the stringency of the measures it has taken. And the darkest the color is, the, the more harsh were uh, the measures, the more strict were the measures taken uh, regarding lockdown. And here, what I want to emphasize is that it's quite complicated for governments to make the to trade off between uh, reducing the number of people that uh, could be infected by the virus, but at the same time uh, looking at the impact on the lives on, on people, specifically people uh, that have low income. And the impact for those people is disastrous. Here, uh, I am sharing with you the results of a survey that was taken in five slums in Nairobi. And what were the results of uh, this, uh, this survey is that 75% of the population that answered the survey uh, left their homes at least three times this, in the, 24, the last 24 hours despite lockdowns. So what does it mean? It means that with or without a lockdown, people need to go out. They need to uh, find a way for their living. It's important information. 36%, a third of this population, lose all their income. So this is a real distress for those uh, families. And what is the impact of uh, this uh, loss of income? The impact is that they had to skip meals or eat less. And 90% of the people that answered say they had to eat less. So um, here the, the decision that has to be taken is quite complicated. Uh, and I'm going to say what I already said. We have to choose in between reducing the number of people that contract the disease or um, putting a, a lot of pressure on family just to have access to food. So um, the, the situation is quite complicated. And the answer to that is testing. If there were enough access to test, uh, then it would allow people to be uh, tracked and to see how the, the, the disease uh, would evolve and it will make it will be it will enable a release on uh, the lockdowns 
Uh, but here, unfortunately, what we see is that uh, wealthier countries have been able to afford um, tracking, um, tracking tests, but it has been more difficult for uh, other countries. And here we can see in blue, African countries and in red, um, other, other countries in the world. And we can see below it's the GDP per capita. And here we have the number of tests that were taken per 1,000 people. And the, the good news here that I want to share with you, and uh, especially with you, you are uh, young, innovative people, is that a lot of innovation had already, is already taking place in uh, Africa. For example, in Ghana, uh, also uh, Uganda and South Africa, they have developed new, new, new tests uh, which give results in a uh, few minutes. In Ghana, they have results in, in between 15 to 20 minutes. In South Africa, in, uh, the, 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 in one hour. So this is a really um, this is really good and it gives hopes. In Senegal and, and uh, also Uganda, they have developed a, a testing kit that cost less than one dollar. So it will make it really uh, much more accessible to um, to the countries. And I'm insisting here because you are going to work on the, some kind of innovation, and there is a lot. Uh, to to propose uh, regarding this uh, the current situation. So now I will uh, give uh, the the floor to uh, Ramona and Ramona, you tell me, and I will uh, go and, and move the the PowerPoints as uh, you request. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to change the slides for me, please? Sure, I will change the slides for you. Uh, so, um, in about uh, this like, no? Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Uh, actually, Ramona, I don't know if uh, it's the same for others, but... Uh, I'm not hearing you properly, also. Yes. The connection is uh, quite uh, bad from your side. Yeah, I try to speak slowly. <laughs> so, we can catch everything. Okay. Uh, so, per um, perhaps, sorry, Renomana, perhaps if you uh, turn off the camera because it's, it's really hard to understand uh, okay. what, what you say. Is it better now? Not really, unfortunately. Can you hear me? But it's strange because in other conversation, I could hear you perfectly. I don't know if you have change of uh, network or something. Try to. Uh, Ramona, in the meantime, uh, try to uh, find a better spot if you are with the Wi-Fi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in the meantime, that you change your position, if there are any questions for Leticia. She presented a lot of data. No questions. I have a question just for I don't know if it is easy to reply, but how UN collect data? So is there like people on the ground, uh, you receive data from governments, who are providing you all this data? 
so depending on the area, there are different ways of for us to collect the data, but uh, mainly we work with um, the data managed by governments, official data, because there is also always this difficulty on uh, but so the United Nations is the representation of their member states. So we have to use the data that our member states uh, consider as, as uh, official. But then you have some really specific information that is not uh, collected by the, the government. So for example, at the moment, we are running a, a, a survey for directed to the um, private sector on how they will uh, what is their experience in terms of the, how the impact the COVID-19 has uh, impacted them. So this is an online survey that we are sending to everyone and, try, and hoping to have uh, as many answers as possible. Um, but, and then also when we have specific studies on a specific area, we might ask to, to request um, some some data on this issue, but the main source of information is uh, data managed by, by government. We do not produce by ourselves huge amount of uh, of data. Uh, the World Bank is uh, or the IMF um, ha have more this capacity than we are. We're, we we use those data to do our report and to do some projection, but we are not the one that um, that raised those data. Thank you, Leticia. So, Ramona, try to speak again. See okay, if it is no, working. It should be better. Be Much sure. better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, in this section, I'm in this prosperity section. I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, direct impact of uh, this pandemic on the um, GDP and growth. Um, then um, um, I will speak about the impact uh, on society, on a focus uh, with a focus on women particularly, and um, then the impact of uh, on trade, on a with a focus on travel and tourism, and uh, uh, about uh, the fiscal risks. Um, so next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, um, According to ECA estimates, um, in 2020, uh, there's an expectation about drop in growth um, for 2020, and uh, it will fall 1.4% uh, from a 3.2 initial forecast uh, in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, uh, it will fall from 3.2% to 1.8%. Uh, um, um, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slowdown of growth will have an impact on um, employment generation and on poverty. This graph shows uh, um, the baseline forecast for uh, poverty effect in blue and uh, uh, the impact on employment generation in orange. Uh, it's estimated that uh, between 5 and 29 uh, million people will be pushed below the extreme poverty line of $1.9 per day. Uh, and uh, uh, 19 million uh, job lost, up to 19 million job lost, uh, with the um, vulnerable share of employment uh, um, up to 10%. Uh, the most, uh, next slide please. The most uh, um, affected uh, will be are women. Um, disproportionately, they are uh, disproportionately uh, affected by uh, this um, pandemic because uh, they are restricted to um, the lockdown restrictions keep the family together and there is the risk of domestic increased domestic violence. Um, also because they are the frontline medical workers. In fact, 80% of nurses are women in South Africa. And also um, cross-border traders, 70% uh, of them are women and uh, uh, they are impacted, impacted by border closures, uh, mostly because they um, work uh, in informal, in this informal economy, so there are no um, um, social uh, protection for them. 
Um, so also um, another point to mention is the fact that uh, um, staying at home and uh, um, this pandemic situation will push them to an increased household responsibility like child raising because schools are closed and uh, uh, because uh, uh, families or fem fem mem family members uh, are um, ill. So they will be pushed to spend um, more hours of unpaid work. Um, so the graph on the, on the right shows uh, the average uh, um, time spent by women compared to men in unpaid work. Uh, and it uh, uh, is between two and 11 times more uh, time um, they spent on paid work than men. Um, then next slide, please. Um, then this pandemic will ha has an impact also on trade. Uh, as you can see on the left, the composition of Africa's total exports, uh, petroleum is um, has a significant share with 40%, representing 40% of total exports. And it uh, suffers uh, uh, during February uh, and March, it suffered a 20% uh, uh, down in price. Um, but also uh, cotton um, and uh, metals had um, a down uh, in prices approximately uh, and respectively about 26 and 20 percent. Um, so this will have a uh, huge impact on growth and uh, the possibility to, um, to recover afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, in the private sector, um, on average, um, there are African firms uh, are not operating to full capacity, um, but uh, according to a survey conducted in April, they are um, at low capacity rates at 30 to 40% for goods and 40 to 50% on services. Um, and the top challenges reported by African companies during this pandemic are the drop in demand and because uh, there is a reduction of opportunities to meet new customers also and uh, the lack of operational cash flow to uh, pay the uh, fixed costs uh, of uh, keeping running their companies. Uh, but also labor restrictions to keep uh, workers uh, uh, or um, safely in the, at work and the logistic difficulties uh, um, and shipping of products due to the COVID. Um, next slide, please. Um, here I as a special focus on uh, uh, tourism and air transportation. Um, which is almost a complete collapse. Um, interesting is the fact that uh, tourism and air transportation contributes uh, um, to GDP um, as a heavy contribution to GDP, uh, especially for the Seychelles um, that uh, accounts for 38% of the GDP to tourism and air transportation, uh, followed by Capo Verde, um, Capo Verde uh, with a quarter of the GDP um, due to um, tourism, and Mauritius with a 15%, but also others, as you can see from the graph on the right, uh, um, tourism is um, a great slice of their GDP. So if you count that 95% of uh, uh, 1 point billion tourists in Africa comes from outside, um, the pandemic has uh, had a huge impact on uh, this sector and disproportionately impact uh, also uh, the small islands. Um, that I mentioned before. And um, also in the uh, job market, uh, um, 
this uh, sector contributes and gives jobs to 6.1 million people directly. Um, yes, I, it's, it's important to uh, take into consideration this sector and see what's the impact of the pandemic on, on tourism and air transportation. It's not indifferent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as the fiscal uh, impact of uh, the pandemic on, uh, on yeah, um, we can say that uh, um, even before the pandemic, uh, over uh, half of African countries had fiscal deficits uh, that were above 3% in 2019, as shown in the left uh, table. Um, due to this already um, macro fiscal uh, position that was not favorable for these countries, uh, with, the, um, with the pandemic, uh, um, they are limited into the pandemic response. And uh, while some countries can turn to the market to seek funds and uh, uh, raise money, uh, the others uh, are extremely in difficulty because of uh, um, the high debt, the high uh, cost of borrowing um, due to their um, uncertainty around their debt and uh, the risks associated with uh, uh, borrowing from uh, um, bond markets. Uh, so mm, they are more in difficulty due to the high uh, cost of uh, uh, borrowing. And uh, um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, and financing uh, the response, uh, to finance their response, they would need uh, to mobilize a uh, hundred billion dollars. Um, <clears throat> to uh, research to um, finance the African healthcare first of, of all, to uh, provide the uh, needed material to save lives and hospital and uh, hospitals and the equipment for uh, emergency services. But not only, uh, they would need this money to um, increase distribution of unemployment benefits and uh, medical insurance payments uh, to support endangered sectors like tourism, hospitality and travel, um, but also to consumer demand support uh, with uh, postponed uh, um, tax payments and value added tax exemptions. Um, and also to support pharmaceutical imports uh, and the increase, increased healthcare expenditures due to the situation. Um, they uh, can raise also um, IMF uh, uh, special drawing rights. It's um, support uh, uh, from the uh, IMF to uh, provide liqui liquidity to uh, financial sectors, private sectors, and in particular SMEs over the next two to three years to uh, help them rebuild after uh, this pandemic. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> also, um, there an important <laughs> thing to mention is uh, the governance of the AIDS. Um, in fact, uh, African governments must ensure the proper use of uh, any COVID financial assistance and uh, extra borrowing um, <clears throat> uh, that have, in, because in recent years, African countries um, have come under the spotlight for public finance management matters. And uh, the graph shows uh, the country policy and institutional assessment score of the public sector. Uh, this is carried out by the World Bank to measure um, the ability of countries to make effective use of aid. Um, the assessment consists of a set of 16 criteria rated on a scale from one very weak 
to six very strong. Um, this to show that the governance and the use of these aids should be um, fairly used, distributed, because otherwise uh, the future generation would pay the consequences and the young population don't want this government, actual governments, to, uh, <clears throat> to put pressure on their future, that a pressure there is already on the climate that I will talk in the next section. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in this uh, section, I will talk about uh, uh, medical supplies, the basic food access, and the needed cooperation and leadership to uh, overcome this pandemic situation, and also uh, um, ICT sectors, to, the possibility to uh, leverage ICT sector to, um, to help recovery with uh, special attention to uh, climate and uh, um, climate resilience. Next slide, please. So let's start from medical supplies. Um, <clears throat> we can see that medical um, supply, African countries uh, um, import uh, the majority of daily medical supplies. Uh, that are highly uh, and heavily taxed. Um, in the right uh, table, we can see that the uh, soap, uh, like bar, liquid, and others, which account for uh, 839 million uh, annual imports, uh, are taxed uh, and tariffs on this. Um, these imports are uh, on average 24 percent uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, they are up to 50 percent and uh, mm, <laughs> it's huge africa must mm, yes the tariffs uh, of the products are too high constraining the affordable acquisition and distribution to the population and uh, must do something on this point, um, thinking about boosting its outproductive capacity and of um, medical supplies to um, face this pandemic. Another important to mention protective garments, uh, which uh, accounts for 748 uh, million uh, are Tariffs on this protective garment uh, are 18% uh, and up to 40% in certain cases. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, for for what concerns uh, foods, food, um, <clears throat> you can say that uh, in total, Africa is dependent on imports for approximately 29% of cereals. Um, as for uh, the rice imports, uh, uh, you can see uh, some graphics on the left. During the pandemics, uh, uh, there, there, um, there are some export funds or quotas imposed by um, other countries from which uh, Africa imports. Um, for what concerns rice uh, during this pandemic, uh, um, the, uh, Vietnam and Myanmar have imposed uh, rice exportation bans. And uh, also from India, uh, the um, rice export stalled due to national lockdowns. Uh, for what concerns wheat imports, in, on the graph uh, uh, on the right, um, also here Russia um, have introduced restriction or quotas on wheat exports uh, to that may affect North African wheat importers like uh, Algeria, Egypt, and Morocco. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so cooperation is uh, uh, important and is needed, much needed to lead uh, uh, Africa's response uh, and uh, um, to help 
African countries to face uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm, first of all, uh, there is demand to urgent access to uh, medical intellectual property rights. Um, the World Trade Organization um, decisions on trade-related aspects of uh, intellectual property rights establish a precedent for producers in developing and least developed countries to use patents for otherwise protected pharmaceutical and other products. But there is further uh, need and demand uh, for sharing novel patents, designs, and uh, techniques to, um, to needed for the production and pre of priority production uh, of vaccines, but also ventilators and uh, rapid testing kits and other much needed. Um, medical consumables uh, to face uh, uh, the pandemic. Another um, issue or another, um, another solution um, is to uh, ensure international mov movement of critical health and technical experts um, <clears throat> to uh, supervise and uh, enable the production of essential medical supplies uh, made in African factories. Uh, in fact, uh, there is the need to avoid, like the Indian manufacturers reported, travel downs uh, um, at, um, for these experts and health professionals who are the ones that uh, um, can and have the ability to rapidly accelerate production of medical equipment. Also, the cancelled flight capacity of national carriers uh, um, can redirect towards this movement of, of towards chartered movement of expertise that is required uh, um, where uh, the need is uh, most compelling. Next slide, please. Uh, Another uh, option is uh, uh, to needed option. <laughs> Actually, it's not an option, but it's needed. Needed uh, response uh, is to pool and share medical quality standard and resources. Um, like uh, uh, European Committee for Standardizations agreed uh, um, to make available standards for uh, medical devices and personal protective equipment and also African standards bodies need to pool and share resources to expedite testing and uh, uh, approval of African production to fast track the process towards the production of the much needed uh, medical, uh, medical um, equipment production but uh, the production that is quality approved uh, by standards. Uh, also, a cooperation needs to leverage regional coordination. Um, in fact, uh, Africa's regional economic communities should uh, um, set up joint reporting mechanisms on availability of supplies and production facilities. Um, <clears throat> in fact, a number of African countries already um, share, uh, have medical supply capacity that uh, can be expanded through collaboration, can be more expanded. Um, also, uh, the African countries must use the African continental free trade area to create regional value chains in Africa uh, to better uh, serve the health market, uh, which is valued 259 billion. Um, to respond next, okay. <laughs> to respond the um, this pandemic, the ICT sector uh, should be levered, leveraged. Um, <clears throat> just to mention, forty percent of Africans lack an official ID, like a birth certificate, and this hampers the ability to, of the governments to identify and distribute welfare benefits and services like India is doing, um, with, which 
who is distributing social payments directly uh, through the uh, ID, thanks to the IDs. Mm, it's important to, um, to say also that uh, Africa faces several challenges in fully leveraging digital technologies in the fight against the pandemic. In fact, only 25% of the Africans currently use the internet and only 76% of the population has mobile phone subscription. Um, moreover, um, for deep penetration access, uh, the continent is still low, as you can see in the um, in the in the image on the right, uh, um, the dark green um, countries are, are have a 75% and above of mobile uh, broadband penetration in Africa, and the light green uh, are the ones that with the uh, less than 25% broadband penetration. Uh, and during this uh, period, uh, the ICT sector experiences uh, a mixed impact with increasing demand from remote for remote working and education, but also a fall in major investments in conferences that were planned for this year. Um, <clears throat> And uh, um, the government should focus more on initiative that uh, leverages ICT that can, uh, like financial payment services to avoid uh, handling of uh, physical uh, money to avoid the, the spread of virus through this vector, uh, but also mobile health initiative uh, that can help during these pandemics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, it's important to mention also uh, the climate change because this pandemic is slightly linked with this uh, uh, the, with climate. Um, in fact, Africa remains the continent that is mostly and severely threatened by climate change and projections. Uh, um, uh, projections are. Uh, says that 15% of reduction of the GDP um, is due to uh, climate change in West and East Africa. And, uh, um, and also in North and Southern Africa, uh, about 10% uh, um, projected the reduction in GDP due to climate change uh, from here to by 25 to 50. Um, emissions during this period uh, have fallen sharply by COVID slowdown, but uh, as uh, the financial crisis of 2008 um, predicted, uh, this is an experience. This experience shows uh, that they will likely bounce back faster. Um, as uh, they did after the uh, 28 financial crisis. Also, um, governments must prioritize this fiscal uh, stimulus spending on green growth projects uh, uh, to avoid uh, this bounce back uh, with the um, uh, emissions that may rapidly in a low oil price scenario uh, under which governments may be tempted to stimulate rapid growth through investments in high emission activities. So, they should focus more on green growth projects and avoid uh, uh, this tempting uh, situation where economic growth uh, is easier, but with high uh, emissions. Um, and also uh, climate change uh, is tightly and closely uh, related uh, to um, disease, this disease and uh, um, land degradation and the increases of loss of natural habitats for wild animals, increasing likelihoods of human contact with such animals. Um, so this uh, recovery should be uh, climate resilient and uh, climate conscious. Over to you, Leticia. Thank you, 
Um, so briefly, just to summarize some of uh, the recommendation of policy responses. So on the people side, what we recommend that the ECA is to have a strong public health campaign and testing. Testing is really a key part of the solution. Countries also need to be prepared to treat and cure. Uh, this means also uh, having uh, enough um, hospital beds, but uh, healthcare workers. Um, speaking about healthcare workers, it is key for them to have access to protected garments. And what we mentioned uh, already is uh, that it is important to suspend tariffs on uh, imports related to uh, medical supplies. On the prosperity side, and here I'm just picking some of the recommendations that Ramona did that uh, are, are most um, important. The first point is, of course, money. Money, money, money. The continent needs money. And it needs money. So we recommend to mobilize $100 billion just as a reference in Europe. Uh, the fund that the plan is, uh, is to invest around 150 billion uh, US dollars. And how to spend this money now? It's on green recovery uh, and a recovery that will also protect and increase uh, job opportunities. And I'm insisting on this aspect on green recovery because this is a un unique opportunity for Africa, but also globally, to have such amount of money invested in, uh, in the private sector. And we don't want um, that the next generation of firms, of companies, uh, we don't want them to be polluting more and not protecting our environment. So here, this is really a one time in the life opportunity to invest in uh, green sectors. What is particularly important in Africa is to invest in the informal sector and in SMEs, because this is, those are the, the, the sectors where uh, that are recruiting a large amount of people. So, how do we reach uh, those, um, the informal sector and SME? Mainly by having broad-based measures, like uh, reducing electricity charges, for example. Last point on prosperity is fight corruption. We don't want that even just one small dollar does, do not go to uh, the recovery. We want to make sure that all the money that will come to the country will be spent where it has to be spent. And on partnership, uh, once again, the money area is really important. Uh, what we recommend is to have two-year debt standstill for all Africa. So two years without paying the debt. It does not, it's, it's different to a cancellation of the debt. It's just two years of uh, brief for Africa of not having to spend the, the money on uh, paying its debt. Uh, we are requesting financing partners to uh, give uh, budgetary support to the continent, to grant access to emergency medical supplies and staple foods. There is a high risk of uh, malnutrition and famine. And we have seen uh, famine in countries, for example, in uh, South America, where uh, the, 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 it was uh, just a few months ago, it was not thinkable, of, uh, it was inimaginable to think that a famine could reach, uh, for example, uh, a country such as uh, Chile, and now people are going out in the street because they are saying they have no access to food. So here we have, this is extremely important to make sure that people will have access to food share intellectual property on vaccines, uh, of course, really important. Involve women in the decision-making. And finally, keep the African, continent sorry, African continental free trade area momentum. Uh, we are seeing that countries tend to um, to close their border, but we need to think ahead and uh, and protect what has been achieved so far regarding the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and uh, keep being ambitious on this agenda. 
and um, we have finished. Thank you very much. I can see that we've been talking a lot, so um, I don't know if you have uh, any question, but we will be pleased to answer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Letizia. Thank you, Ramona. A lot of data and information. I hope students can use this information to select the best projects to design in these two weeks. Any question? Yes, uh, I've got a question for, for Ramona. Am I right? Yes, go. Yeah, my question is, I saw he, he just mentioned that the, the initial uh, idea is to, to fund uh, about 100, 100 billion USD. Uh, so with this program, Obora, is it just a pilot or it's something like there's a, there's, there's project, there's programs on the pipeline to actually fund venture caps. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> that that's the question, or you wanted to add something more? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's just the the, the question that uh, is this program Upora just a pilot, or there's still gonna be more? follow-up uh, uh, programs that uh, you guys will use to obviously fund the venture camps. If uh -huh. uh, I am right, and then uh, Leticia can uh, add on if uh, she wants. This is a suggestion of a hundred uh, billion dollars uh, is, um, is for governments uh, and uh, uh, to it's suggestions for them to mobilize and try to use and how to use this money to respond to the COVID pandemic. While uh, the program uh, you are in, the Ubora, uh, I think it's a separate one, if I am I right? Uh, and Leticia can come in to help me. <laughs> So I can help you without any problem because you probably understood the, the question. Uh, so this activity, this boot camp, uh, is just, let's say, one part of a very huge and big plan that is not only rely on us. Regarding Ubora, Ubora is a platform, it stays there and it's a tool that you can use whatever you want. Uh, I can tell you that um, we hope to generate good ideas in these two weeks, uh, rush, especially in these first days, because if the projects are in enough in a good stage and the ideas that are uh, brilliant and in a good level enough, probably on Friday, we will have the opportunity to present them uh, in the forum uh, that uh, runs in parallel to this event. Uh, and there are uh, different opportunities for funding uh, because there are both government and investors. If the ideas that you propose are good, uh, why not receive a grant? It's not a promise, it's an opportunity. Oh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm asking this is because it's I mean, South Africa. In South Africa, most SMMEs are struggling to to uh, to secure funding. You find that it's being distributed in in corruption, you know, in friends, and there's so much nepotism. Whereas you find that there's too many ideas on the ground. Uh, it's not that there are no creativities that are are are, are, are there to to, to to actually invent, innovate new ideas. And also with the, the thing you mentioned yesterday, Camero, the, the IP. The IP is still a, a tricky part, especially for upcoming SMMEs. Like you find that you, you can't even have funds to actually 
have your IP uh, for your for your products or for your idea that you're trying to take out there in the market. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. So Terras, Terrence, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Terrence thank you. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, to throw my question to Leticia if she can uh, respond. Um, there's a part in the presentation where just taking off from um, the previous person who asked the question uh, from South Africa to say one of the biggest challenges we have mostly in Africa has to do with um, transparency when it comes to running projects like these. I know for a fact UN must have systems that are robust such that uh, they minimize uh, the risk of uh, facing such challenges such as corruption and, and, and ETC. Uh, my, my question mostly is uh, meant to maybe sharpen or uh, think ahead with regards to modeling the, the business around whatever solution we're going to come up with to say, how then do we safeguard it from um, such a uh, risk of uh, a misappropriation of funds? Uh, thank you. This is a huge uh, question and I think if there was an easy answer, then we will have um, put it in place. Uh, just um, before I, I got back to you, uh, just to give some, um, some more information on this uh, 100 billion. This, this is money that um, ECA, but also other stakeholders, me, uh, African ministers and uh, African finance ministers and the uh, World Bank and the uh, uh, F, um, F, in French we say FME, IMF, sorry, in, in English. Uh, this is money that is, is what we estimate that should be available for the recovery in Africa. It's not money that is, uh, that is granted or available. This is what we are requesting. And of course, there, there will be a huge um, debate and negotiation with uh, all uh, with the uh, with the, the financing partners. But coming back on this issue on, on corruption, uh, it have, we, 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 I think from the, the UN side and from the, the international uh, community side, we have to fight for transparency to make sure that we know where uh, the, the, the money is going and to do, have a look at each step. But also, I really believe that in each one of your country, uh, civil society also has a huge uh, role to play there to, to fight for, for, once again, more, more transparency. And um, um, so I'm, I'm from South America, and what's, so I'm, I'm most confident to, to talk about the, the situation in, in, in South Africa. Uh, sorry, South America. Um, and what is also what I can say about the society in, in for example, in Ecuador, where, where I am from, is that sadly often uh, um, corruption is in all the layers of the society. We tend to, uh, to focus on uh, the one that steal the most because they have uh, uh, more, more, more access to incomes, but it's, it's everywhere. It's also um, in, uh, you know, when you go into the street and you find the police, we, we all know how it goes. So uh, I would say that the fight is uh, um, a, general, uh, a general struggle for all the society at all levels to to try to to go away from this um, uh, corruption and sadly it's it's existing in uh, south uh, america in africa but everywhere in the world it's uh, we we here also have also to be uh, cautious that and um, have bear this in mind it's it's everywhere so here the civil society um, has a huge um, huge role to play thanks Uh, Benjamin, uh, sorry, for perhaps uh, Benjamin, yes, has requested. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think my point is also um, uh, dwelling on, on the corruption issue. I actually want to understand how um, how do you define uh, corruption actually in Africa? How do you define corruption um, in terms of this issue? Um, so that I can proceed with the the, the, the next question. 
Uh, I can try to answer to that, but as I was saying, my um, my background is uh, more as an uh, economist working on the environment. So I'm not a speci I'm not specialized on, on governance issue and on corruption. So I can't give you um, the perspective of the, the the official definition of social social uh, science on, on this corruption. But uh, basically, what I would say is that the the money does not. The, the, the flow of money is disrupted and does not go where it was initially intended to go, but at some point uh, someone uh, take it for, its, for, for another purpose. Uh, th this is the answer I would give, but it's not a, a social science uh, and definition. Oh, okay, uh, okay. So, like, I, I'm really, I'm really um, much concerned about how you guys are going to monitor um, corruption in terms of the utilization of the monies that are given to the um, heads of states or the government bodies. Are you going to uh, have agencies? Um, I know already UN has um, its agencies um, in various countries, but are those agencies going to partner with them in terms of um, distribution of the funds or? Uh, uh, how are you going to take critical look? For instance, um, when you come to my country in Ghana here, um, culture also plays a role um, in, um, in in corruption, what people term as corruption. In, in, in Ghana here, um, if you are meeting somebody like um, um, a chief or a king or something, somebody does something for you, um, you need to show appreciation. So in that sense, you pay something, you're talking for me, it's, it's part of the culture. I don't know. So if something like this is happening, so um, how, how are you going to monitor, uh, um, kick off um, the culture-based aspect and actually be able to distinguish clearly that this is what is happening, this is not what is happening, this is right, this is wrong. And how are you actually going to, uh, because I'm really concerned, uh, uh, corruption in Africa has been on the, on the set and I don't know how you people are going to deal with this issue. Those are really hard questions, but I will uh, send you back the question. Also, as, as you're mentioning, there is a cultural aspect. Um, and perhaps also, uh, so you need, you need to define what is a corruption, what is acceptable as a part of a payment for something that has been done, because also we can understand that the, the transaction between uh, uh, someone that does something for you in some way needs to 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 be paid so perhaps the the concepts of corruption needs to be um, defined by by like I think also we are talking about different things we if we talk about this one uh, 100 billion uh, dollars then it will not go through um, um, local channels, or perhaps at the at the end, uh, if when once it goes to really the on, on the uh, locally, but the the international community has a role to play on those um, national uh, scales, and there they will ask and insist for transparency. But then I, I, the way I see things, and when I was talking also about civil society, is that um, uh, Africa also needs to implement their own rules and not wait for um, uh, institution outside the country to say what is, uh, what is uh, good or bad. It's, it's also African uh, intellectuals in Africa, people working in Africa, that uh, needs to to uh, um, to make sure that there is uh, no corruption. I, I hope that uh, you get my point uh, on that. Is that it's it's not the, the rule does not need to come from outside. It needs to come also from inside the country and uh, the, the different countries. Um, this is what I. Would like to to say but keeping in mind that uh, uh, now we are talking about what's what is a corruption and what is not corruption so I, I think we all agree on a large part of what corruption is that is just small um, uh, definition on the side that perhaps is a bit uh, uh, blurry but I think we mostly all agree on, on what is a corruption, 
and that um, this is this is clear and and this is where we need transparency to see where the money goes oh, all right thank you very much so i want to thank again letizia and ramona if there are no other question i'll stop also the registration i'll put i think there is one more question in the chat i can see uh it's, uh, um, it's asking me to elaborate more on the cpia uh, score it was uh, um, actually the one i mentioned before about country policy and institutional assessment uh, and what it means from the low to high score uh, I can uh, I can answer to this question. Actually, um, the World Bank is doing this assessment for each country each year uh, and assessing their transparency and their um, how yeah transparency regarding the aid they receive. So the level of corruption, but they cannot call. Uh, um, it like that directly. Uh, they measure this their transparency and how about how they use this uh, these aids, um, their management of the aids, uh, where they use the aids, uh, and uh, uh, the effectiveness the, uh, they um, reach uh, using their these aids. So. Um, on these 16 criteria, they give a score from one that, uh, that means uh, a low score, uh, so low transparency, low effectiveness, low management of the aid, to the sixth, uh, sixth point that is high transparency, high um, effectiveness and management of the aid. Um, if uh, I answer the questions, this that means uh, uh, this is the meaning of the score and the, um, this uh, assessment. Okay, I, if I don't know if I answered the question properly and uh, how Allah uh, wanted me to, okay, <laughs> answer that, okay, in the chat. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you again. I apologize for not checking the the chat so let's stop let's go stop recording